about zero knowledge. And the dominant narrative about ZK proofs in industry right now is very much about scaling Ethereum. And while that is really exciting, we'd like to introduce a few other scenarios, a few other case studies that we think that you'll find very interesting and exciting that where ZK proofs could be applied. So the magic of zero knowledge it allows us to rethink and reinvent how we think about security, identity, privacy, compliance, and interoperability. And this afternoon, we've got two sessions. First, we'll have four lightning talks with four projects that will give you an idea about what they're building and how they're building it. And then we'll have a fireside chat uh, with uh, a few founders, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into the use cases of each project and why they're making the decisions that they are. And by the way, if anyone has a question or any feedback, then you can make yourself known to Flora, who's, saying, who's at the back. She's going to be the moderator of the panel discussion this afternoon. All right. One of the guys from our uh, hosts couldn't make it. His flight was canceled, but he kindly made a video. So I'm going to play his video as an introduction. He's from, his name is Chris from BTQ. And let's hope everything works well. Hey, it's Denver. Super excited to be sharing what BTQ is working on with all of you. So in a nutshell, BTQ builds post-quantum infrastructure for blockchains. We're working on post-quantum cryptography to secure blockchains against attacks by both classical and quantum computers. We're working on hardware to accelerate computations for post-quantum cryptographic primitives. And we're also exploring applications of quantum algorithms in blockchains. So our company was founded by a team of post-quantum cryptography researchers and research and, research and development is, is at the core of everything that we do. So some of our early research production includes the first NIST compliant post-quantum aggregate signature, as well as proof of concepts in post-quantum zero knowledge acceleration hardware. We're working with some fantastic teams around the world on both the application and research side, including eTree and TSMC in Taiwan, Macquarie University in Australia, and Holonym, who's a co-panelist on today's event. So a lot of what fuels us to do research in post-quantum cryptography is driven by the rapid developments in quantum computing research. In 2022, governments had by then announced over $20 billion in funding directed to, to research in quantum computing. And there's also been a significant increase in attention paid by, by private companies. So this includes hundreds of new startups, as well as substantial investments from leading technology companies towards quantum computing research and development. So we're fortunate to be able to build upon the foundation laid by giants of organizations like NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and is widely recognized for its role in establishing international standards for cryptographic algorithms. So in the past year, the standardization of the first ever post-quantum digital signature algorithms has provided guidance to teams like ours on how to incorporate post-quantum cryptography into blockchains. However, a major problem for post-quantum cryptography is the overhead associated with these algorithms. So post-quantum algorithms tend to be an order of magnitude more expensive than pre-quantum algorithms, such as ECDSA. And so at BTQ, our core research focus is on reducing implementation and usage costs of post-quantum cryptography for blockchains. 
So our research has culminated into a series of products that we'll be releasing this year and next. Keelung on the left is a zero knowledge domain specific language and compiler with a library of post quantum cryptographic primitives and compatibility with a number of post quantum zero knowledge proving systems. Kenting is specialized hardware to accelerate post quantum zero knowledge proof generation. PQ scale is a scaling engine for quantum resistant blockchain transactions. And QSIM is hardware to accelerate post quantum crypto algorithms such as those standardized by NIST. So we're super excited about the growing popularity of zero knowledge and all the new applications yet to be tapped into. And we look forward to collaborating with all of you to build a more secure and decentralized future. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to get in touch, I would love to chat. You can find me on Twitter at the QR code on the screen. My handle is also at underscore Chris Tam 96. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. So Chris is actually going to be here this evening. Uh, his flight was canceled yesterday. He was supposed to be this morning. But uh, if you see him, say hello to him. He's an awesome dude. So I'm going to call up uh, our next speaker from Holonem. So Shadi, over to you. Hello, hey guys. Uh, it's really great to see such an incredible evolution of ETH Denver. Uh, my name is Shadi, I'm a co-founder at Holonym. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a sec. Uh, fun fact, Holonym was born here exactly one year ago at ETH Denver, trying to solve a problem that we were stumped about. But I, I'm kind of curious to know if this is an issue that people are still dealing with today. So I would love to know who here is uh, a developer? Great, you're in the right place. <laughs> Who here uh, is, is familiar with ZK or has been working on ZK projects? Perfect, okay, so you're all definitely in the right place. Um, and then last question, last question. Uh, how many of you have been stumped with the issue of how do we deal with private data on public blockchains? All right, about half, half of you. So it sounds like the other half have the solution, so definitely wanna talk to you afterwards. Um, Perfect, yeah, so uh, Nanak and I, we came together at East Denver at a hackathon. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we both came from uh, Georgetown. We were doing research in neuroscience, and then we were interested in how we could enforce claims on things like data sets that were being published in decentralized science or DSI protocols. And then we figured out, okay, holy crap, like there's a huge issue here. There's very few ways to do this uh, on a public blockchain without doxing people. So we built Holonym, which is this uh, ZK protocol that allows you to issue SBTs derived from proofs uh, generated from a, ZK, uh, uh, from a ZK circuit. So, you know, we've come a long way since then, and we've realized that, hey, like, Holonym just doesn't solve issues for scientists that want to prove ownership of their IP on chain or other types of creators that want to prove things about, their, about themselves. Uh, but specifically, we're kind of at this crossroads right now within Web3 where regulation's coming, it's a storm that's on the horizon, it has, it's a mixed bag, right? And so it's pretty clear, I think, that institutional adoption or the embracing of Web3 into mainstream crypto commerce, right? Making crypto commerce mainstream, uh, it's not gonna be possible without institutional, um, uh, without regulatory compliance and mechanisms for that that drive well, both with Web3 principles and uh, the existing system, which we think is also gonna have to change as well. So what do I mean really by this precipice that we're standing on? So I kind of see that, I don't know, if we look forward towards the future and what kind of systems might emerge if blockchain really does satisfy all of the, all these blockchain and Web3 systems really satisfy all the needs and requirements uh, that they're attempting to tackle. So there's, we're, we're kind of at this energy landscape, right, where uh, a series of decisions that we make at the policy scale, at the, you know, perhaps development scale, the things that we choose to roll out, the way that we roll them out, will lead either to this situation where we have a centralized authoritarian protocol that has this like, non-consensual relationship with its citizens or peers, and we're all basically in service or enthralled to uh, this centralized protocol, right? So think like China, but running on a blockchain and everything's automated, really scary. Uh, on the other side, right, and I, I really think it's a dichotomy, and if you think otherwise, would love to chat with you afterwards and, and, and dive into this more deeply. On the other side, uh, we're 
I imagine more of a public goods regen sort of future where you have a central, uh, maybe distributed protocol that acts in service of clients. So we're all basically using a protocol to disintermediate um, uh, trust, uh, to rely on the mathematics when it comes to crypto commerce, when it comes to proving things about uh, ourselves while maintaining anonymity. So we're at this inflection point, and we need to make decisions today how we drive the ball down that energy landscape towards the future that we want to see. And I think you all would agree uh, that option B or path B is the one that we want to be down. So uh, how do we really solve some of these issues, right? And I think a lot of it has to do with coming together and coordinating and co-opting this human-centric path. Uh, you know, I'm not going to chat with, you, to you, with you all, all you guys here about the details of this, but yeah, I mean, smart contracts, right? They help us consent into structures of cooperation uh, towards goal-directed group behavior, right? That's something that wasn't really possible before in code. And we need to think very carefully about how things like privacy, uh, how other tools such as identity also uh, uh, play into that. Key to this really is public-private key cryptography. So being able to establish self-sovereignty in these autonomous systems begins with identity provenance, so knowing who, what, when, and how long uh, a certain entity or agent has interacted with the protocol. So the privacy conundrum on public blockchains, you know, I mean, if any of you guys follow, for example, uh, Constitution DAO, right? So Constitution DAO was a DAO that was coming together using Juicebox to raise a bunch of funds to buy the Constitution. Really epic story. You know, Nick Cage would be proud. Um, however, they had like this really, you know, specific, you know, problem, <laughs> which is that all of their uh, governance, their voting, their on-chain actions were public. And this is a general uh, problem for public blockchains in general. Right? So, for example, take this uh, toy use case where you have some proposal that's up for a vote, and you can see on chain all of the different DIDs and whether they're voting yes or no on a particular trigger action or a particular contract execution flow. So, there's a couple problems with this. One is uh, you can't really tell if those DIDs are different people or the same person. So, Sybil attacks are a major problem here. It's very difficult to hold these DIDs accountable. So, for example, if you do determine that somebody is trying to rug pull this contract or influence the governance, I mean, what are you going to do to try to get them to pay up, right? Or, or uh, be held accountable. And in most cases, privacy is black or white if you try to solve these issues, right? So either you dox everybody before you onboard them into your DAO, or you just deal with the fact that you could, you know, you're not sure who people are or what their intentions are. So there is a middle ground, and this, you know, this is not a no novel concept, it's not a new idea, and it's pretty clear at this point, I think, that reputation systems are gonna be key for engineering around this. But on-chain reputation is really hard, right? So we've seen this try to be tackled in many different ways. Um, how do you even verify off-chain behavior? How do you prevent people from selling their reputation? Um, how do you maintain user consent as you collect user, user reputation? So for example, FICO or the Chinese social credit score, you know, there's not a lot of consent involved there and it could be abused, right? So that's really important. Central to all of this is how do you maintain privacy in these reputation systems? So that's why we built Holonym. Holonym specifically for developers that want to upgrade their dApp with ZK proofs on identity that maintain privacy on public blockchains. Uh, we take, we, we, well, we took inspiration, continuously taking inspiration from Nick Zabo in 1994. Uh, check it out. He wrote a paper where he introduced smart contracts before Vitalik ever, ever put uh, cursor to terminal. And uh, he specifically spoke about NIMS as these little pieces of identifying information that only reveal the exact bit of info that you need to execute some function or enter into some contractual agreement through code. So we've taken that approach and we've used ZK to wrap individual NIMS, such as uh, different components of your driver's license, like your name, the country, uh, your social security number, <laughs> whether you have good or bad vision. Um, Biometrics, for example, is another idea. So for example, a hashed version of your uh, uh, face through face ID or your fingerprint scan through, uh, like a, through a FIDO2 compliant cryptographic scheme using uh, iOS or like web accounts. So we, take, we, we built a protocol that allows you to take these individual NIMs and then wrap them uh, in a ZK cloak called a hollow. And then from that hollow, which is represented on chain as a global Merkle tree, uh, as a hashed global Merkle tree, uh, you can produce proofs on your own uh, self and then mint those proofs as SBTs to an address that you control performing certain specific actions within a, say like one SBT to prove you're a US resident to engage in a lobby three political uh, uh, act, right? Because you're a US resident, you wanna govern over funds specifically for uh, campaign, campaign support for Web3 advocacy, right? While maintaining compliant. And there's some other really interesting use cases here. I can definitely chat about them after the talk if you're interested. 
Uh, the way that it works, really, really, really coarsely, um, is that we, we're this hybrid cryptographic solution, right? So uh, basically, on-chain, we're a protocol that allows any off-chain issuer to plug in and generate ZK proofs on their users while maintaining privacy for the user. And the way that this is done is that the user uh, accesses some portal, uh, some third-party KYC, say, through like Vouched or Persona. It could be like the DMV even could run their own issuer. And they submit their credentials. The credentials get verified, hashed. There's a nullifier scheme in there that, the, that is eventually replaced by a random seed from the user. So once they receive their hashed, verified, signed credentials from the issuer, the user now has substitutes that with their own uh, salt and pepper. And then that's put on chain through a relayer. So the user doesn't even have to interact or pay gas at any point, And they remain anonymous. They don't have to dox a certain DID that they've interacted, say, with this IP address and this DID with this DMV or this you know, KYC provider. And that's passed on to this global Merkle tree where the user is added as a leaf in that tree. And then from there, we can produce proofs on top of that identity, such as they're not a bot, uh, that they are from the US or not from the US, uh, or perhaps that they own some intellectual property. Uh, so I alluded to before who's using this. Uh, Lobby3 is using this because they want to be a licensed lobbying DAO. But to do so, they need to be able to provide proof that their users aren't from Russia or other countries even, because there's laws against that. Uh, and so that allows us to achieve credibility within these policy circles. It allows Web3 to really continue get building momentum and going mainstream. Uh, Gitcoin's using this as well for uh, low, uh, low, low friction onboarding KYC for their users. That's also privacy preserving. Uh, and there's other uh, use cases as well. I would love to chat with you guys about them. So this is just a start. Uh, we think that this is the tip of the iceberg, and especially when it comes to verifying, for example, like professional credentials or legal status or uh, whether a business really is a business when it's on chain and really bridging these to uh, the old world with the new. So it's just not me. Uh, come find us. Uh, about half of our team is here today at ETH Denver. Uh, I think you can find Nanak in the back there. Caleb is also floating around. Uh, and would love to chat with you guys about ZK, how you think you might use it, uh, and tell us, you know, what would you know, what would you like to see as well as, as a solution uh, to to private identity on public blockchains? Thank you. So we at ZKX are actually building on Holonym. We're about to experiment with them, and we're gonna build. We're actually building on ZK Link, who are our next speaker. So I'm going to welcome Vince, who's the co-founder of CK Link. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vince, co-founder of CK Link. Today, uh, it is my pleasure to come to East Denver from a long way. I fly from Singapore. Uh, it's, it's a long way. Uh, to present the specific use case that we're building with ZKP. A uh, multi-chain trading layer secured with ZK Snarks. Uh, these, we started about two years ago. Since day one, we are very much focused on trading. So the target, the purpose of ZKLink is to bring decentralized trading to the next level. So we empower the next generation of decentralized trading solutions. Uh, on this graphic, you can see that this is the general architecture of ZKLink roll up, ZK roll up uh, network. Uh, on the bottom of this graphic, you can see that we are connected with multiple layer one blockchains and also other layer two networks. For example, we, for the layer ones that we are connected today, there are Ethereum, BNB Chain, Avalanche, Polygon, etc., Solana, etc. And layer two networks were going forward with Starknet, ZK Sync, Scroll Finance, Helmets, etc. And uh, on our unified roll up contract, uh, we, we can aggregate the assets, native tokens, and the liquidities from all these connected layer one and the layer twos. On top of our uh, roll-up platform, builders are able to build multiple uh, different types of applications such as AM DEX, order book DEX, uh, uh, NFT marketplace, uh, derivative products, and uh, uh, wallet, etc. So what is special about ZKLink? As a unified multi-chain trading layer for DeFi and NFT assets, first of all, ZKLink is developer-friendly. Uh, the development cost for, for developers on ZKLink is extremely low, as we provide high-level integrated APIs to enable developers to quickly deploy the products that they have. For example, order book exchange, AMMs, constant, constant products, univ2v3, etc. 
and we are highly customizable. As a spe application specific rollup, we provide full freedom to play with different parameters to enable developers to go, go deep in certain features and optimize these features to provide the state-of-the-art user experience and minimize the cost at the same time. And uh, uh, we can provide, on our platform, we can provide unified multi-chain liquidity and token merge assets aggregation. For example, you are able to build a, a DEX that can merge uh, liquidity from Ethereum, from Solana, from Starknet, et cetera. Uh, this slice is a general te technical architecture of how a multi-chain zk -Rop works. Uh, on the right, you, uh, the, the right graphic explains how we settle transactions uh, in the, uh, using ZKP. They, we record all the deposits from connected blockchains and layer two networks and a unified state tray. And uh, every once in a while, when there will be some transactions and trades happening on the ZKLink layer two network, and then uh, we uh, re generate a recursive ZKP containing several blocks that has the information of, tra of thousands of transactions, and then we send this same ZKP to blockchain A, B, C, D. And and, and the, the, the ZKP containing the transaction information will be verified and settled by the smart contract we deployed on each of these connected net networks. On the left side, you, you see that we, to ensure, that, to minimize the risk of conspiracy, to ensure that we are sending the same ZKP, the same final route containing the same transaction and deposit information, uh, we have implemented a, a third party independent decentralized network of oracles to check that we are actually sending the same final routes to each of these blockchains. So this consistency check is very simple, but a very uh, uh, it's, it's necessary to ensure that the sequencers at the beginning will not be able to uh, rock users' funds. Uh, so this is the security design of Zikling. To By separating these two steps, we ensure that the risk of conspiracy is minimized. Uh, so we, what we have done so far uh, in the past two years, we have built a unified state tray to record all the users' funds from different blockchains. We have very many token merge liquidity aggregation. We, uh, we have designed some trader-friendly features, for example, we can now support up to 65,535 order slots so traders can place nearly unlimited orders on the order book exchange, for example. Uh, and then we can merge a uh, heterogeneous account system so we can support EVM blockchains together with non-EVM blockchains like Solana, like Starknet. And we can also support auto connection and disconnection of alien blockchains. For example, if there is some risk that we believe that is going to happen with any of the connected layer ones or layer twos, the DAO can decide and uh, <coughs> and disconnect this blockchain. And w of course, uh, mostly we have done a lot of work around the performance optimization and the cost optimization. Uh, we have passed millions of tests in data volume. The isolated app ID design improves concurrent processing of the state trees to support a really, really powerful and uh, a CEX like the decentralized balance. Uh, we also have developed a risk control engine. Uh, that some of the next steps that we're going to do going forward, we're going to we're right now we are building uh, the features to support derivatives trading, derivative products like prep contracts and uh, structured products, etc. And also we had uh, developing some toolkits for developers to be more developer friendly, integrated Rust SDK, GS SDK, Go SDK, and, uh, and provide a unified coding standard. Of course, uh, security is always the focus. We are strengthening the security level by decentralizing the sequencers uh, in the beginning, when we go live, in the, in the beginning, we, we, there will be only one sequencer, uh, just exactly the same as other layer two networks in, uh, for eco economical reasons. Um, but uh, going forward, in the long term, we'll go in, we, are, we will incentivize uh, community to decentralize the sequencer. 
to become more censorship resistant. And we'll go, of course, we we will we will go we're gonna continually uh, optimize the performance and cost of the circuits on the circuit level. Uh, so uh, around the ZK Link uh, multi chain uh, roll up network, you, uh, developers can quickly build and deploy products such as multi chain AM DAX, uh, multi chain order book exchange, multi chain NFT marketplace, a multi chain version of Immutable X, uh, a launchpad, and, and wallet, etc. Uh, in crypto, we believe that nothing is more important than security. So to further explore the security boundary of ZK Link's uh, multi-chain ZK Roop network, we have planned the, an, a com an community event. We call it Dunkirk. So what is Dunkirk? It is a user asset evacuation plan. So imagine that worst scenario just happened. The ZK Link network is down. The server is gone. ZK Link team is gone. Everything goes silent, and users can no longer access to the layer two network. So, how can users withdraw their fund, get back their fund as promised? This is the promise of layer two, and especially zk Rob layer twos. So, the Dunkirk is an open source recovery program that anyone can initiate. Uh, for developers or users from community, uh, you will be able to visit a uh, library that we. Uh, we will open source when we go live on mainnet. So with the code and the instructions we uh, stored in the library, anyone can start the recovery code and build a front end and allow users to access to generate a zero knowledge proof and use the data stored on chain. The historic states stored on chain will allow users to withdraw their funds um, back to the wallet. For example, if you have 10 Ethereum Deposit it to the smart contract and deposit it to Zikilinga layer two. And when, when the disaster just happens, when the alien one from the community, after a certain period, of course, there will be a silence period. So to make sure that the team is gone, right? And so everything goes out. Then someone or anyone from community can just start the recovery program. And then users can, with the help of this recovery codes, you can generate zero knowledge proof and a withdraw your fund. For sports, it's, it's very simple. For contract assets, uh, this recovery code will, at the same time, uh, trigger the liquidation with the last on-chain price fit, and then uh, the rest of the steps are exactly as the sports assets. So here we warmly welcome everyone to become uh, in our incentivized safe house partners. We have prepared this Dunkirk rehearsal. So before we go live, we will go live very soon this year. Uh, we will do at least the one time of Dunkirk to show the users, to show traders that how a ZK Roop network can be safe and under the extreme condition that your fund still under your control and you can get it back. And for uh, developers or a, for any community members, it's very simple to run this program. You just need to have a, a, a domain that is public accessible and also you uh, just build a front end, a very simple front end. Thank you very much. Um, the future of decentralized trading, I think, will be ZK linked. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bilal. I'm one of the co-founders at ZKEX. OK, so around a year ago, ZKEX was created. We can say that we're also an ETH Denver baby, partially from the pain and dismay of how we felt crypto was going, and also from the excitement and optimism about how we can improve things. So from day one, when we formed, our, when we formed uh, the project, we asked ourselves the question, how can we better empower people to trade any crypto from any network using any coin in a single step? And the answer one year ago was 
You can't. You need to set up di different wallets for different networks, move money using different bridges, and use different stable coins every single time. The answer even now today, one year later, is still you can't. And the complexity with more L1s and more L2s has only got worse and more complicated. So we'd like to welcome you to the future because later this year, ZKX will go live. We're building an omni-chain uh, club decks using, for a multi-chain world using zero-knowledge proofs. And this is going to be a DEX with a CEX-like experience, without user experience compromises, without functionality constraints, and without security risks. The problem we're solving is quite simple. Quite simply, decentralized trading is broken at pretty much every single level. So users are facing complicated experiences, fragmented liquidity across different wallets and chains and networks, and limited functionality if you're a trader. So traders really have no other option. If you go to a pro trader, they're all using CEXs, and they have to give up custody of, of their assets. <clears throat> the question is, why is that? Why do CEXs still have their market share? And the answer is that decentralized trading right now is far from perfect. And these problems actually result in billions of dollars of losses, sometimes intentional, some in unintentional, from hacks, mistakes, and other unnecessary risks. Now, after the DeFi summer, what we saw was a movement from CEXs to DeFi. But because of uh, uh, declining, um, uh, de declining yields, a lot of those people have moved back to CEXs. And even post FTX collapse, CEXs have, have actually regained those few percentage points which they lost initially, and they've regained it back. So people are, again, moving back to centralized uh, protocols and, and, and projects. And why is that? It's, I think we all have experienced this pain that um, e, uh, uh, EOA wallets are super unfriendly, and especially for a newcomer, you usually have to get someone's help to tell you what to do and how to, how to get set up. Private keys are really easy to get lost or stolen, and so the chance of you losing your assets is relatively high. We recently had a community um, a Twitter space, and a lot of our community was saying, one after another, we heard so many sad stories about how people lost their money in, in, different, different, way, in different ways. The second problem is that liquidity is hugely fragmented in DeFi across all these different networks. The third problem is that AMMs don't really support advanced type, uh, types of um, uh, products, such, such as derivatives. And there have been a few attempts to do this, but there's nothing really satisfactory for traders. And the problems for CEXs are even more obvious. So there's always these nonstop rumors about a CEX that's about to get rugged, that maybe they don't actually have the assets they claim they, they do. And as, uh, as people who believe in crypto and DeFi in general, um, you know, we're always told to never give up our keys or our coins, but really, do we? Most of us do. So these actually are super difficult problems, but we believe it's actually a huge opportunity for us for, who, 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 where we think we have a solution. Now, what we think is conservatively, if at the moment the amount of revenue, the, the amount of user fees generated around $2 billion uh, per year as of last year, but if we even have a conservative growth of around 60% growth rate per year, in the next three years, that might be an $8 billion opportunity. That's even on the current product set at the moment without considering new products come on, coming online. So there's a massive opportunity here for DeFi to grow a lot, lot bigger. The market we believe right now is structured with CEX dominating 90% of the market. And their business model right now is being challenged. We, we've all heard about regulation, and they are really worried about how, what they're going to do in the, in the new future. So we can see that there's highly regulated uh, CEXs, some which are partially regulated, and you've got uh, DeFi on the, on the left. What we believe is actually in the future, there will be a split. The spectrum of crypto trading will definitely split in two very cleanly to de decentralize on the left and highly regulated exchanges on the right. And the question for you is, which, one do you want, which way direction do you want to go? Now, even with derivative products, which are, uh, bring up a lot of trading volume, uh, the traders actually have a stronger incentive to move out of CEXs for safety and compliance reasons. Now, why do we think ZKX will take over the market share that is currently being held by CEXs? Well, we have a really simple answer. It's quite simply, we break any limitation that exists right now for any other decks, any order book decks. 
So when a CEX user uses our product, they won't really tell any difference between whether they're using a CEX or whether it's ours. The only difference is really that you're not giving up custody of your assets and it's fully decentralized at every level. There's no counterparty risk. So let me elaborate on that a little bit more. Our product is simple. And we're essentially building a uh, central uh, limit order book DEX built on a multi-chain uh, layer two ZK link. And it will solve the problem of both uh, DEXs and CEXs by combining the smooth trading experience of a CEX and with a omni-chain uh, operability uh, uh, club DEX. And we've got several killer features we think are new to the market and no one else has actually thought about or, th or thought about uh, implementing. And we are really focused on optimizing the trading experience and capital efficiency. So first off, there's no cross-chain risks. You trade with native assets. And as you know, a lot of assets have been lost or hacked in, on bridges over the last few years. And it's always a bit worrying when you actually send a large amount of money from one chain to another. You have this moment of not knowing where the money doesn't exist anywhere at the moment. You have about 15, 20 minutes of pure panic where you, until you wait for it to arrive on the, on, the, on the other end. So that experience is really very unsettling. There's a lot of anxiety there. And you can essentially uh, trade from a single multi-chain L2 wallet across multiple chains, very smooth and very easy. You can aggregate all that liquidity as well because we support different types of stable coins, USDC and uh, a few others. Um, and they can all be, uh, uh, all be um, merged together as a single USD uh, token, as a trading token. And we also massively uh, reduce the trading costs for traders as well. And we can support pretty much any kind of trading experience. So we've actually finished our matching engine settlement uh, system for uh, our DEX. And all, all that's really left to do is to plug in market makers and connect to ZK Link to achieve finality for transactions. And we believe that we actually have the fastest and cheapest layer two solution for trading. Other L2 solutions uh, are, have massively reduced their cost over the last one or two years. But we believe ZKEX can achieve instant settlement and self-custody with the lowest possible cost in industry. So we are the only omni-chain DEX to have to offer a true CEX experience. We're the only omni-chain DEX that's built on zero-knowledge rollups. So we're actually building for traders, for professional traders. And it will be the first DEX that supports portfolio margin and provides a full spectrum of, of products for pro traders. So with pro portfolio margin, um, all of your assets, whether they're a spot, spot leverage, or contract assets, they can all be used as collateral. So capital efficiency reach, reaches the, the highest level possible. And even among CEXs, I think only uh, Binance and OKX have this feature at the moment. And we'll be the very first DEX to, to have this feature. And one of the biggest obstacles is onboarding and getting users to actually come on board as quickly and, and simply as possible. And of course, the problems with EO, EO wallets are, are well known. And so we'll have a very simple solution where we'll uh, um, prioritize smart contract wallets, uh, social login, and with the log club UI, we think we can have very rapid user adoption very, very quickly. And uh, essentially, the, the matching engine and settlement system have actually reached the same levels of CEXs already. And we're going to find a way to connect the two without compromising the user experience. So we'll have that experience in both web and, and mobile. The question is, why did we choose to build on layer two with uh, ZK proofs? There are many other different models, such as intermediate blockchains and uh, using other, other L2s as well. But we think that with zero knowledge proofs, we can deliver the security, scale, decentralization, and interoperability needed for a true opti, um, omni-chain club DEX. So the, one of the biggest problems of when you're trading across multiple chains is the security, that worry, that anxiety, but also the risk of hacking. And with ZK proofs, we have a uh, a foolproof way, and in fact, it's not even, not even satisfactory for us. Uh, we actually have actually built ZKX to the point where even we can't rug pill our own system as well. So we've actually implemented a two-stage checks and balances uh, uh, security model, um, first with ZK proofs and secondly with a decentralized uh, check with independent oracles. And we're giving traders uh, really low gas fees, fast finality, and, and huge massive sc uh, scalability. And also we're giving market makers who are very, very important for us the massive, huge high put they need, uh, high throughput they need because computationally doing everything on change is extremely expensive. So with the L2 that gives us that, the, the ability to scale up and speed and make things very, very fast. 
And other L2s which we're building on, ZK Link, ZK Sync, Stockware, um, Hermes, and um, also Scroll, they're all on track for full decentralization. So we're kind of happy with that. We're only picking the projects which we believe actually believe in crypto and um, are, are, are doing good things in, in industry. This gives a really good, a really simple idea about our architecture. So essentially, we have two main groups of products. One is the spot product. One is derivatives. And ZKX offers you that multi-chain on um, the multi-chain wallet. You're trading from a single wallet. You can buy any any coin, any so you can buy any token on any chain using any any coin. So this this is completely new in industry at the moment. So we're aggregating all your stable coins from multiple wallets into one pot, essentially. But it's still self-custodial. It's not like you're not uploading, uh, not sending anything to us. It's all trade from your own wallet. And on the L2 and L front, we're connecting to as many um, reliable uh, networks as possible. But even, um, a lot of people ask us about other chains, but really, even right now, this is about 80% of the market, 70, 80% of the market. We'll think about other chains, such as Solana and all the move uh, LL ones a little bit later. So this product is being built by crypto veterans. So there's actually four co-founders, and we've got a team uh, in total of about 10 or, 10 or 11 thereabouts. And we've all got a, a strong track record. But we also, as well as having expertise in exchanges, building exchanges, both derivative products, market making, and also high-frequency uh, high trading, we've also got uh, a lot of expertise in uh, in UI, in, in community building as well. So we have a small but very uh, strong team. And we're, we're very much capable of, uh, of building this. And a lot of people say that, oh, this is a really nice idea. And when are you actually going to live, go live? And the really quick answer is, we are super close to going live. Because we actually built most of the, mo mo most, most of, uh, most of the uh, most of the exchange, the spot product is pretty much ready. Where the derivatives product, which is a perpetual contract, is in design right now, and uh, we're actually looking now to work with the right people. So we are actually looking to hire developers as well. But most critically, for, on the business side, we want to speak to inv strategic investors and market makers, and, uh, and and pro traders as well to come on board to give them something uh, to actually help us push us push us over the line. And the best way to get involved with us and to make an intro with us is actually to go to our testnet and to critique us. We would love your feedback. We're on version two right now. We've got reasonable traction at the moment. We've got four million transactions that were done by around 65,000 pretty active community members. We would love to, you guys to test it. Grill us by all means, criticize us. Uh, my co-founder is actually here as well. One of the co-founders is here. His name's Easy. He's at the back with the white, with the white shirt. And uh, anything you want to say, we're, we're happy to hear it. We're very, very open, and uh, we'd love to hear from your feedback. So uh, that's me. Thank you so much. And now I think we will move to the next stage of our um, session today. We're pretty much bang on time. So we've had 45 minutes of talks. We have 45 minutes of maybe some good discussion. So I think I'll call to the stage our moderator, Flora, who's going to host our panel discussion, come on board, and Shadi Vince. Could you come on, come on stage as well? And we were going to have a speaker from DTQ come on board as well, but he's still on, his air, on the airplane, I think. So uh, yeah, do you guys want to join? Test, test, test. Okay, we're good to go. Hey, folks. Good afternoon. 
Today we're going to continue the session with a little bit of a deep dive on how our users can benefit from ZK applications. So hi, I'm Flora. I'm the Chief of Staff at Airfoil Studio, a Web3 design and engineering studio, early stage venture fund, and also an in-house product incubator. Alongside me on stage today, we have builders from ZKX.com, a bridgeless omni-chain order book DEX, secured by ZK Rollups, Holonym.id, a zero-knowledge identity protocol for civil resistance, anonymous KYC, and wallet recovery, and last but not least, ZK Link, a multi-chain trading layer secured with ZK Snarks. So most of the discussions that we've had at ETH Denver so far about, are about how you can build your dApp or protocol. But in this session, we'd like to dive a little bit deeper into why you're doing it and for whom you're building for. All the builders here today are utilizing zero-knowledge technology in some way or another. Personally, I'm interested in the user experience of ZK proofs and dApps. The tech is often hidden in the background of dApps, so the user might not actually feel the benefit of privacy or security, other than just being told that it's more private secure. With ZK, we can rethink how we approach concepts like security, identity, privacy, compliance, and interoperability. With that said, my first question for each one of you is, could you please explain to the audience what zero knowledge proofs are and why they're important in the way that you understand best? Shadi, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so ZK proofs, right? It kind of sounds like arcane magic. Who came up with that term anyway? But it's a technology that's been around since the late 80s. Um, the real use cases for it, though, haven't been made apparent until recently within, within the blockchain space. I think like uh, Vitalik, other academics, uh, Stanford-based uh, Dan Bonet, have really shown that there's incredible potential when you combine the power of a public distributed blockchain uh, to serve proofs on any entity or any object or event or trigger out there in the real world. So what do I mean by proofs? Well, a proof is something where you input some, some data, some claim, and that claim uh, evaluates to a true or false, right? And so that black box, that magic in the middle, that's where the ZK happens. Uh, so what we can do with the ZK proof is that we can take things like, say, with Holonym, your uh, driver's license, and we can prove with a QR code using just math on the back end that you are above 21, can enter the club, uh, get partying, and all that good stuff. Uh, so so, so that's, that's one take on, on ZK proofs, and I'm kind of excited to hear what you guys have. Okay. Sorry. Hey, so uh, that's a pretty good explanation. <clears throat> I'm going to take a different tact. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think ZK proofs mean for ordinary people, and I think it's a, it's a chance, an opportunity for ordinary people in the world to preserve their privacy and to preserve uh, sovereignty over everything they have, whether it's money or their, their personal data or, or their personal information. Because we've got into this society now where everything is open, everything is kind of transmitted. Um, I, for example, like the most annoying thing happens, like you get an email from a random person that you never uh, subscribe to or you don't know. Someone sold your email address to someone else and they're, now you're being sent, sent, sent marketing information. So nothing is private anymore, unfortunately. And ZK Proofs gives this ability to prove information, which is needed in, in the world. You have to prove yourself in some ways, right? But then you also want, don't want to give away your entire wallet information, your personal ID, your date of birth, everything to everyone. You don't need to give this information away. So this is the very first time, I think, in technology where we actually do this in a way that, where you don't have to trust any middle party. So you, the proof is generated using mathematics, and it's kind of it's, uh, essentially can be trusted. And uh, no, one, no one's in the middle, essentially. So I think for, from a user's perspective, I think what people don't understand is it's a very complicated technology. But as developers, I think the impact you can have on people's lives is immense. And in, we talked about use cases. Most of the use cases on things like uh, scaling, which is really important. It saves us a lot of money, make things faster, sure. But outside of that, to impact people's lives, I think outside of crypto uh, is 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 the impact is immense. And you think, I think even the, uh, the, the potential of DeFi, I think, is still people think really small about what DeFi is and what it could be. And I think DeFi will not grow. It will not succeed. It will fail without zero-knowledge technology protecting users. Because this is what, what we're doing is we're not doing it for ourselves. We're actually building for the world, essentially. It's a, it's a crazy wild dream. But actually, we do need technologies like this 
to protect ourselves and, and just kind of and make things uh, better for everyone. So I think from a user's perspective, that's what I think about a lot. So Vince, uh, maybe you can say something as well. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, we have seen a lot of things. Yeah, no, I, I, I think they have already uh, explained uh, what is ZK Proof. And I would like to elaborate a little bit more on the amazing properties that uh, Zero Knowledge Proof can bring us, especially in crypto. So in our case, uh, we utilize, because it, is, uh, it delivers a verifiable and trustless off-chain environment, which allow us to process the data, uh, the transactions, at an immense amount and at an uh, acceptable cost. This will make a real difference in crypto trading, at the least. That's because I know the best, personally I know the best about the crypto trading. I, I'm not very familiar with the IDs and other you know, uh, use cases of zero knowledge proofs, but there are a lot of amazing properties and to explore. Uh, in our case, we just try our best to uh, bring the decentralized uh, trading to the next level, to a level that everyone can use and that uh, everyone will use. Uh, I, I just want to hop in real quick too and expand uh, a little bit on what Bilal was saying. So I think this is really important. We should underscore it. Um, so why are we here today? <laughs> and I think a lot of that has to do with kind of a reactionary pendulum to how technology has developed and come to enter our lives in different ways. And, you know, we start off as a distributed, decentralized ARPANET, right? Uh, moving to federated systems, eventually emergence of cloud. You know, I'm repeating history that we all know here. But I think what's really important for technology, especially in how it moves towards the future where uh, we automate more and more of, of our society, our functions, our commerce. Uh, we put more of ourselves into technology, you know, when we start thinking about cybernetics. Uh, consent is going to be the most important thing in tech moving forward after this. And what do I mean by consent? Well, when we interact with an application today, we accept cookies. We, you know, uh, log in, we send a transaction, and we don't really know what's happening behind on the back end. And so, you know, this has come to bite us back in the butts, both as users and companies as well that have to deal with the liability for this sort of thing. Uh, so it's a problem shared by everyone. And ZK Proofs give us this, I think, amazing opportunity for a paradigm shift where we embed voluntary co uh, cooperation into the mechanisms of, 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 of technology, spe specifically decentralized technology. So I think, so my background is as a neuroscientist. You can ask me later how I got into what I'm doing right now. But I, one, one thing that I'm, I kind of really think of um, that's important in biology is uh, agency, right? So that's one really peculiar trait about uh, the brain. It's, you know, it's, agent, it's very difficult to know what's going on in someone's head. And that's what gives them agency. That's what gives them, you could argue, free will if you want to get philosophical. But uh, when we're talking about technology, the ability to keep the things that you're transacting about or coordinating over private is going to be absolutely important for embedding these systems with agency and self-sovereignty. Right. Thanks, Shadi. So since we're at ETH Denver, a hackathon, and this is a full circle moment for a few of our projects here, I want to discuss a bit more about what you're building. So for Shadi at Holonum, where's the demand for on-chain identity coming from? It's understandable that users might want to prevent giving out personal data, but why would an organization not want to collect user data? Yeah, that's a really good question. So to answer the, the first part, uh, we had no idea that we would like make Holonym like a thing, like an actual protocol. Uh, you know, at the time it was called like WTF, <laughs> just as an acronym for Web Token Forwarding when we were working with JWTs. Uh, we quickly changed that branding though uh, to attract some VC funding. Uh, so, so now, yes, yeah, so is here now today. So at the time we were really just trying to solve problems for ourselves and friends and those problems had to do with, well, how do I prove claims? Uh, how do I know that this person really is like owning this piece of data or how do we know we're not getting Sybil attacked? Uh, since then, uh, you know, we made a really strong pivot to ZK after working on uh, basically like JWTs on chain and, and using uh, some, some interesting hashing functions there. And most of the use cases that have come to us are DAOs that are trying to either achieve legitimacy or credibility in the real world. So they want to prove that, 
you know, their members are lawyers, right? But they want to maintain privacy. Uh, and the same thing, whether it's like uh, a medical DAO that wants to prove, hey, like we want to offer medical services, peer review, expert-based services on chain in a completely permissionless way, and we want to have a token and all this stuff. But like, how can we really prove that we have MDs? How are people going to trust that? Uh, so that's another use case. Um, and then I think, you know, as we, you know, we've, we've primarily focused on DAOs that need to verify their members with privacy, uh, developers that want to put stuff on chain and prove things about their users, but, you know, are a little feeling kind of like skittish about dealing with uh, actually custody of the data. So GDPR is really interesting uh, for us specifically, because in GDPR there's a clause about data controllers. Every single uh, privacy policy has to have an identified data controller, and this is the person where the buck stops. Uh, the data controller usually is the one that ends up getting in trouble or fined or put out of business if they get breached or don't follow some very specific uh, compliance criteria. Nobody wants to be a data controller. So you know, where we're seeing most of the demand moving forward into the future as we mature as a technology, as a protocol, and achieve more serious generalized use cases outside of just DAOs, uh, is how do we disintermediate uh, the data controller, right? So we have some really exciting tech that we just put out uh, um, that we just put, put, have put out there recently that allows us to automate uh, a lot of the stuff using smart contracts, right? To have transparent accountability, to make sure that data controllers are, um, are, can be put more into the math and that organizations, companies, dApps don't have to deal with the regulations of going through all the compliance, can just focus on building. I've, I've... So I've got a question actually. So a lot of the use cases right now for you guys is on-chain, but what about off-chain? Like what about a really simple scenario like healthcare? Like being able to go to a hospital, get healthcare, and now, let's say you, you forgot your passport, and okay, you, I've got a hollow instead can I, to prove who I am. So is that, do you think off-chain scenarios are possible as well? Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up, Bilal. And I don't want this to turn into the Holland show at all. Uh, so, but uh, no, that's a really great question. And okay, so really interesting, uh, there's these guys they're called HairDAO, and they're trying to solve male pattern baldness with a token. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they're trying to wrap IP or an NFT around the IP for that and then do this whole like decentralized clinical trials thing. And so they reached out to us because they wanted to make sure that those folks that were claiming hair tokens are actually like bald people that deserve the token that are using the technology. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so so yeah, that made us scratch our heads for a little bit. But the use case actually uh, was was uh, was was really there because not only are they needing to prove things that everyone needs to prove, like KYC or civil resistance or whatever, um, they also want to they 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 upload the they have their users upload their genes um, and they're looking for specific phenotypes and SNPs that they can use to you know, uh, you know, do different types of analyses or different types of coordination. So there's a whole, you know, we haven't even barely gotten into this yet, but ZK proofs on things about yourselves, like biometrics about yourselves in healthcare are completely game changing. You could, for example, be part of a decentralized clinical trial in a rare disease and prove ownership that you are in this patient DAO. You can have ownership over the therapeutics that are, that are produced out of it. And you never have to dox yourself and say, you know, I'm that dude with like, you know, the weird hair or or something like that, right? Um, at least not online, maybe not in person. Your, your use case is to find things that people feel shameful about <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then protect their privacy. Like that, that's a use case. Uh, something juicy. I don't know what it is, but something like that. Yeah. Well, not just shameful things, but... <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I think like also like off-chain for like age verification, like for gambling, uh, now that all CCPA is just past a bunch of like age requirements. Uh, there's different ways to deal with that, and I think they're pretty flexible, but I think in the future, gating things by age, content, residency is going to, uh, that, that hammer is going to drop down um, more so in the future, and we think that ZK can protect consumers. So for off-chain, that's, that's kind of what we're, what we're thinking. Yeah. Right, so lots of interesting applications for hollows, you know, coming to you. And now for ZK Link. So what are some of the trade-offs for being an app-specific roll-up versus a general-purpose L2? It seems like a lot of general-purpose L2s are for the mass market of bigger ecosystems, evaluations, and also media attention. So why did you choose this app-specific niche? Uh, what benefits do the users themselves get? This is a very good question. Okay. 
I have to admit first that the general purpose layer tools of today, the major ZK layer tools, the four ones that I, I think everyone in this room is aware of, has raised way more capital at a way more higher valuation than we did. And there's, uh, because they have a bigger story. Simply, a general purpose network can have more possibilities and than an application specific row up network. And, but there are some things that can, an application specific row up can do better than a general purpose layer two. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> okay, so first of all, the development cost, overall development cost of app, app specific row up is uh, significantly lower than a general purpose network. Uh, so we, we start as a small group of engineers. So uh, uh, we are very bullish on general purpose network. We, we think the, the, the ecosystem will boom uh, very soon on general purpose net network, network. But we start as a small group. So we wanted to build something at a reasonable cost and at a reasonable time frame. So we, yeah, that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, in certain fe features, for certain types of products, an app specific roll-up can, be, can do better, can do a better job and then a general purpose layer too, for example. Let me take trading as an example. If you build an exchange on StockNet today, and, uh, you would expect to have a lot of volume in the future, and, but you have to share the bandwidth, you have to share, you have to compete with the other hundreds of projects on the throughputs of StockNet. They will scale for sure, but the, your business very likely will surpass the speed of their sc scaling speeds. So you will very much feel the pain of the bottleneck of you know, the sailing of the throughputs. But an app specific row up can give you, can maximize the performance. You have the bandwidth of your own. You can utilize all the throughputs for one specific business trading, which is highly valuable, highly profitable and we can scale faster than the general purpose network. And we can go deeper in optimization of opcodes. For certain opcodes, for example, atomic swap for order book exchange or constant product curve, we can build that curve in circuits. We can optimize the efficiency, the performance of the circuits to maximize the performance that you need in certain parameters we can play with. And uh, third, uh, application specific rollup can have like you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, an, independent, an independent ecosystem. For example, we're, we're not competing with any of these general purpose net layer tools. We are partnered with them. We, have, we are partnered already with ZK Sync. We are closely connected to their uh, engineers. And StockNet, closely connected as well. Scroll, very close. Uh, Helmes, Polygon Studio is one of the early investors in us. So there's no conflict of interest uh, with them. Well, instead of you know competing, you to to to, to try to attract volume, try to attract uh, traffic from the existing systems. We embrace all of them. We share the growth. We share the prosperity with them. We are a part of the ecosystem. We are chain agnostic, ecosystem independent. So we can be close to anyone, and we can grow upon anyone. Whoever becomes successful in the future will be part of that. We make sure our, we, ourselves will be. A, uh, a, a part of the future, yeah. We're not betting on any single ecosystem. Yeah, this is, uh, there are more reasons, but yeah, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So, thanks for sharing. Now that we've touched upon why we want to have certain applications, let's move on to ZKEX and talk about how we validate product market fit in Web3. Do you think that token incentives might warp the metrics for users? Yeah, this is a, this is a really interesting question. We, we discuss it a lot internally. Um, I mean, the other day I invested in this AI project and I think the next day it got rug pulled. And so like, I'm a little bit worried that ZK is like, getting so much attention that there will be like these fake ZK projects and uh, there will be no, people might lose trust in, in zero knowledge if they get rug pulled and uh, no one actually delivers. I think the key thing here is you look at the deliverables of the team. What, what are they doing in which order? So the first thing that everyone does is they build a community. And here you see a differentiation of the real projects and the potential rug pullers. Because the potential rug pullers will immediately put out their tokenomics model and launch their token and say, hey, we need your help to build our product and blah, 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 whatever. And then that's an immediate indication that actually they don't really have a product. And to be honest, even we know a lot of projects are doing this and they go to big conferences and they speak on the big stage and they, 
we know very well actually internally that they don't actually have the product. All they have is a PowerPoint presentation and they're just kind of going through this years and years of, pro of production development and actually never actually result in anything whatsoever. So we, the real projects you will see will build their community and then start building their product hand in hand with their community. And people ask us a lot of the time, do you guys have a token? Is something out coming? Is something coming out soon? And th the simple answer is we have no idea. We don't even think about it. We don't care right now. We're entirely focused on building community and building the product. So there's two stages. So internally at ZKEX, we have these tiers of community uh, membership. And the, the guys who are most valuable are the ones who are most proactive. So when I was up on stage, I mentioned, please join our community and get, get in touch with us. And that's actually who, where we hire from as well, that the people who are actually active in our community. And they have a massive influence over our roadmap. So it's actually our roadmap is m mostly generated from our community, who are a lot of traders, a lot of uh, DGENs are sitting there. And they're telling us what they want. And this is important. And why are you doing this? This is a waste of time. Don't do this. So it's, it's really, really important. So in terms of the traction we're getting, and uh, in terms of the growth, we hope it will be very, very much in line with building a product that people absolutely love. And, and that's the proof, essentially, uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, execution. So uh, you, you can see it very clearly when projects execute in a certain order. And that's your, that's your indication. Uh, Bilal, yeah, I, I was, yeah, you just got me thinking. Um, so that's really interesting, you know, for ZK with those projects that you know maybe don't have a product. But what are your thoughts on, um, like, what happens to rug pulls when they become ZK'd, right? When you're just interacting with this black box, and you don't even know you have ZK that you've been rug pulled, right? Is is that like a fear? How do you mitigate against that? And how are you guys thinking about it as well? I think education is a massive problem right now. Um, when people ask me, uh, what is your team doing? And I say, we're basically building a DEX that can't be hacked. And the immediate response, every, almost every, every single time is, that's bullshit, dude. Like, everything gets hacked. And uh, everyone says it's secure. So I think education is, is a really big problem right now. And I don't really have an answer. I don't know. Do you have one? I, I, I can't figure this out. Um, well, maybe. I'm probably wrong. But I think uh, ZK snarks are interesting, because then you can prove the result of a particular computation came from some code. So if you're putting up, um, say, like, this is the protocol, and we know that this result was generated from this protocol, and maybe the inputs are shrouded or private, uh, there can be some level of trust. But I don't know if there's a good answer to that. I yeah, think. like, what if your auntie created a hollow, or she's using ZKX? Like, how would she, how would she know? that it's secure and it's private. I, there's that, I mean, we're so used to trusting a third party uh, to, to, to tell us whether something is good or bad. And now if we move into this new world, it's so hard for people to, to actually truly know. Uh, because all the scammers are out here as well. You know, they're literally sitting with us right now. And they've all got bad intentions. But there's good people here too. I'm not saying they're all bad. But <laughs> Yeah, but it's the real problem, like uh, actually getting to that mass market adoption, uh, getting out of ETH Denver and actually going out into Denver and selling your solution, your app, whatever it is, it requires massive education. And there's no real, no one's actually told me how to do this. It's, it's really hard. I think it's really, no one has the perfect answer right now. I actually wonder how is that possible to hack a ZK protocol? I'm trying to understand because in our design, in our security design, this is a focus, one of the focuses we take ourselves as a hacker. So if we can hack it, then others can hack it. If we cannot hack it, then how can others hack it? Yeah, this is our assumption. So in our design, I think this we're pretty much we're like preventing ourselves from being evil. Yeah, so I am, yeah, I'm curious to learn more. How can anyone hack a ZK Snark protocol? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, again, I'm, you know, I may be wrong here, but uh, I think that proofs that are composable can give you like really weird behavior, right? So if you can prove like that you've staked in a contract under certain conditions, and then you can also prove that you have leverage that is within a certain condition through some weird mathematics maybe, like or edge cases that you can't really figure out unless you simulate all of them or battle test it hardcore, you might end up with random exploits that nobody can know about unless you're, you know, that's literally like your day job or that's, you know, you're, you're, you're. so I, I wonder how big that uh, that is of a risk and I don't think we'll know until some of these uh, projects get deployed and we need time to tell, yeah. yeah. So now that we have a little bit more insight into the inner workings of each of your projects, I want to shift gears and ask about the ZK applications. 
for ZKX, um, are the projects and methodologies and technology around ZK rollups overhyped? Uh, will ZK really enable mass adoption or blockchain technology and crypto in the long term? So I should be careful because um, our partners are all here, like ZK Sync and Stockware and ZK Link, they're all sitting here. So we're actually very bullish about all of these rollups and we're really happy that they're getting attention and they'll get more adoption amongst, at least within the Ethereum community and also uh, the crypto community wider as well. I think uh, it's going to be brilliant for Ethereum that when all, the, all of these rollups go, go into mainnet. But I kind of, I'm sitting in the middle a little bit because I'm, I'm a natural pessimist. So I think in the short term, they are getting attention because they're, they're, they're heading towards mainnet. So there's this anticipation for something to happen. But at the same time, if you look at the number of rollups that exist in the market right now, I think I counted there's like 25 or 26 at the moment. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are general purpose rollups that do the same similar things. And there's uh, a, a growing set of application specific rollups. And I really think that not all of them are going to win. And who are going to be the users for all of these rollups? Uh, and because we're still thinking about um, DeFi living inside a little bubble. And <clears throat> for, it to, for it to get out, I think the major problem for user adoption is going to be usability. That's the massive, huge hurdle, which hasn't been solved so far and is not close to being solved at the moment. I mean, we're trying to, uh, I mean, our project is doing our best to try and solve this problem. But I think the, the, uh, the, 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 wider, the wider problem is that um, people don't really uh, see, uh, don't really care about the technology. We're developers, we care about the tech. But the users, the end users, don't care about the L1 or the L2 or the L3. They just want to do a task or they want to do a job in some kind. So I believe in the, in the right now, they're getting a lot of attention, but in the future, people won't even know what chain or network they're interacting on. It will just be like hidden in the background. Just like how like you don't know which database your bank is using. Are they using Post? Progress, or are they using like Oracle? Who knows? You don't care. It, it freaking works, right? So that's how that's how it will go. Um, in our case, we think a lot about uh, the next generation of crypto trading. We're kind of really hyper focused on that and how it might play out. And again, it, it, we think about what are the problems, and ultimately, a lot of the problems, are things like security and privacy and things like that, traders experience is down to lack of functionality and bad usability, which impedes everything. So that's really the way the focus should be. And even as developers, I would really encourage you to not get stuck into the tech too much. You should always take a step back, a breather every so often, and talk to your users and uh, get them to play with your tech and see, is this any good? Is it working or is it good? You'll often find out that you've gone in the wrong direction a little bit and you need to be pulled back a little bit. So that's, that's a very general broad answer. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to also kind of, um, so Chris was supposed to be here today with us uh, from BTQ and I think he would have had a really interesting uh, response to this question. So uh, BTQ has a really long time horizon in terms of what ZK means and what it brings, and they don't just think that it's hype or else they wouldn't be investing you know, 10 years out. So you know, uh, a lot of major topics right now within uh, cryptography in general is how do we ensure you know, the next iteration of, um, all right, so we're at the current RSA, you know, uh, all the RSA algorithms have been upgraded, right? With uh, just in the past, like what, like year or two years, right? I think we're like what, four, 4096 or something. Um, but eventually, we can't keep making our uh, <laughs> our our our, our, uh, our hash functions just bigger and uh, more memory intensive. Eventually, we'll hit a limit. So there's a lot of research uh, going on in post quantum um, uh, resistant uh, uh, cryptography. And BTQ is leading the charge on this, right? So folks like Justin Thaler, who, you know, they were working on one specific area of cryptography and their entire life's work, and then they realized immediately, like, holy crap, you know, we need to figure out how post-quantum uh, systems really are gonna precipitate into reality, and ZK is gonna be a major part of that story. It's gonna start off in the research labs and, and you know, these niche little products, these niche little markets, but in general, when we talk about trusted execute em in environments, we're gonna be talking about uh, hardware acceleration through ZK. We're gonna be talking about, uh, <laughs> uh, we're gonna be talking about, um, uh, yeah, ZK-based uh, proving systems and consumer, like, high phones in, uh, 
uh, in, in, in software. So, so, so yeah, so I think ZK is not just hype. It's something that's going to fundamentally change how technology works. It's really important from this cultural level that we talked about that Bilal brought up earlier, uh, how we actually interact with computers and maintaining consent. And at the very low level, also ensuring that these systems that we're trusting remain hopefully incorruptible uh, by, by adverse actors. Can I throw this question to our host, actually, for a second? Because you have a, UX, uh, a lot of UX experience. So UX in Web3 is kind of a joke, internal joke amongst developers, how not great it is. And uh, how would you communicate something as complicated as a ZK proof to ordinary people, like from your side? What do you think? Right, so with ZK proofs, the way I see it is that you're not revealing information that's unnecessary. Like you're giving people the crux of what they want without necessarily giving away sensitive info. And I think a big thing in Web3 UX right now is that we're actually overloading the users with all these buzzwords of, hey, use this because we're using X technology, even though you as a user at the end of the day probably don't care because you have a problem that you want to solve. At the end of the day, we're providing them with tools and ways to better solve these issues. And with ZK, we're rethinking the ways that we approach things like privacy, security, interoperability, and compliance. So for us, abstraction isn't a bad thing necessarily, but it's actually good. If you're not revealing what someone doesn't need to see, then it can simplify their understanding of the product itself and ultimately lead to a smoother and more concise experience overall. So the original question was, right about the whether ZKP is overhyped today in the market. Okay. Personally, as a ZKP maxi, <coughs> my answer is no. <laughs> I think OP is overhyped. <laughs> the OP ecosystem we see today, yeah, we have seen a lot of traction recently, right? The tokens rising and the big companies, enterprises uh, just adopting the solution. But it's just transitional. I think ZK is going to take over eventually. It's just a time of, it's a matter of time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question of when, not a t question of if. Uh, and ZK is still a, not a uh, mainstream uh, solution or, or not for the mass market. People are still far away from using anything that is you know, built on this technology. What we were just discussing a lot. Last year when I came here, it was like about 10 projects then you know, uh, rela relevance. But this year, I think there will be like uh, 10 times more. Um, this is a good signal. This is a positive signal. A uh, um, lot more builders are coming in this year from last year to this year, and a lot of more capital are flowing in to support the development. But you know, with these amazing properties that we have talked about with, uh, with ZKP, there are many, many different kinds of products, many, probably some beyond our imagination, where we will totally change how people think and how people interact with the, uh, with the crypto applications and how people trade, of course. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, ZK is not overhyped and the market value is still small. There's no major uh, ZKP project that has, you know, has a high, very high market value. If you think of you know, AOTC, what does they do? They do nothing, right? It just consume. This it just consume uh, electricity, nothing else. <laughs> but you know, uh, we, we, we need at least some projects to be higher valued than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's still a long way to go. I think there's still a lot of space to grow. Right. So on that note, I want to each I want to ask each of our panelists here. How do you see the future of zk applications as we evolve? Yeah. So you want to start us off, Shadi? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, maybe I can start off. Uh, so yeah. So actually, we when we built out Holonym, it was specifically. Oh, thank you, Vince. Uh, so it was specifically for developers. Um, you know, we're building backend protocols, you know, or backend API calls that uh, developers can make to do whatever it is that they needed to do. But in the process of getting people to understand what it was that we actually do, we had to build a consumer-facing app first. Um, because just documentation doesn't cut it. I think you know, walking through the flow and seeing where the data is consumed when the third-party identity issuer is called, how the user interacts with their MetaMask or not their MetaMask to do different types of proofs, uh, 
we ended up spending way more time designing the UX <laughs> uh, when we're a B2, you know, we're supposed to be B2B uh, uh, for, for, for the end user, the consumer, uh, than, than, than we anticipated. And I think this is going to be an ongoing, an ongoing theme. So for, for ZK, when we're thinking about what it really does, is it, you know, kind of like uh, blurs out, it's like a selective blurring uh, using encryption for pieces of information. Uh, with provenance behind that. So you know that the blur isn't just blurred arbitrarily, but it's linked to some verifiable chain of, of, of subsequent proofs or dependency on, on, let's say, call it truth. Um, so I think for the user, they're going to have to learn, learn how to really operate in this world where it's not like, hey, look at me, I'm on Twitter, this is my phone number. I mean, this is how I am actually on social media. <laughs> like, you know, here, you know, I conflate all of my information together and I'm pretty public about it, right? And maybe that's not, not a good idea. But I think moving forward, especially when we think about data economies, this buzzword that's been around for, you know, since like, I don't know, like Ethereum launched, maybe even before. Uh, data economies, when we're thinking about uh, self-sovereign data, self-sovereign identity, users are gonna have to learn how to basically be responsible custodians of their own uh, uh, privacy, their own self-representation, who they choose to produce proofs to, right? So if I produce a proof that I'm over 18 and a US resident to some you know, protocol, maybe that's uh, run by a nation state, maybe they would uh, censor me, for example. Maybe we don't want people from um, Monrovia that are over 18 using our application because we don't agree with them politically or something. So, so there's all of these really nuanced, gotcha, UX situations that we're going to find ourselves in. Education's going to be a huge part of that. And I think from now on, DAP development is going to have to keep the end user in mind as well as the developers. And I think it's just the common theme for Web3 in general as well, yeah. What was the question again? Sorry, <laughs> just to make sure, yeah. How do you see ZK applications evolving into the future? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, it's interesting because I was, I was about to talk a little bit on the layer three landscape because now I think today we can start to imagine how you know, the future applications will be like. Uh, layer two is one of the focus of this year, one of the hype, you know, the focus, hype of the, of the year. And this conference, we're gonna, I'm pretty sure that at, uh, in the coming week, we're gonna have a lot of sessions, discussions, panels, speeches on this. And layer three is coming very soon, together with layer two. Uh, uh, so the future applications, uh, from user's perspective, probably they don't care no much about you know, the underlying technology. They only care about the usability, you know, the cost, whether it's easy to use, easy to understand, intuitive, and it's uh, cost effective. Uh, on layer three, will, will they have the possibility to, you know, to build something with re real mass adoption? I'm talking about uh, maybe tens of millions of users, maybe hundreds, uh, may hundreds of millions of users, like like mobile mobile applications. Yeah, those. So I believe that the the pathway for zero knowledge, we're gonna see like applications on layer three with mass adoption very soon. I think what I'm hoping for 2023 is for developer tooling to massively improve in the zk space. Because at the moment, people are, you, you shouldn't need to be a mathematician to develop with ZK proofs. You should just be able to use something and plug it into your DAP, whatever you're building, and your focus should really be on the end user rather than uh, getting stuck into all of these kind of uh, very low-level code. It's like you know when you're uh, coding in assembly as opposed to like a, a high-level language. It's, it's, it's just a waste of your time, and it's not productive, which means that people won't build anything because they can't actually end up building anything in the end. So yeah, uh, that's a really uh, simple hope for 2023. Oh. Awesome. So on that note, I want to give a huge thank you to all three of our panelists today. Let's give them a warm thank you. Yeah, of course.